I'd like to thank Paul for leading the meeting this morning. We go back 47 years. I first met Paul 47 years ago in South End. A long time ago. We were young men in those days. Um, where have all the years gone? And uh, I, some of you will remember that we used to have a member here called Cole Wall, who passed away recently. And some of us went to our funeral on Friday afternoon. And uh, I thought I'd bring along this, uh, so that if it, those of you who remember her will like to uh, have a look at this. It's a lovely tribute to her, and I thought that those who remember her would like to have a read of that. And uh, I remember Cole very well, because she used to love to come to our midweek meeting, our Bible study and prayer meeting, I can remember her coming in one day, and her face was a light. She was full of enthusiasm to come and to hear the word of God. She suffered a great deal from insomnia. She had a great difficulty in sleeping. And I used to talk to her about this great problem. I had that problem as well. And uh, we used to exchange notes on the subject. And uh, it was uh, good to know her. And good to know that she is now absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now we're turning the Word of God to that portion of Scripture that we looked at last time I ministered here, the book of Lamentations and chapter 3. And I want to begin reading at verse 21 through to verse 26. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is God to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. There was a report recently that in North Korea several believers were caught worshipping God. They were discovered by the authorities and they were immediately executed. It was a report by open doors. In Myanmar recently, a Christian village where 320 out of 350 homes were all burned down. If you were to go to Afghanistan today, you would find difficulty in finding believers. Many of them have gone into hiding and fled to other countries because of the terrible threat to their lives. In, a, in the Ukraine recently, a Bible was found by the body of a young soldier, no doubt a Christian believer. And down through the last 2,000 years, Many of God's people have gone through the most horrendous and the most difficult times. We think of Stephen being stoned. And we think of Herod having James the brother of having James the brother of John executed. And if you had gone to Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah, at a time when this was written, and you look to Jerusalem and you see the terrible devastation that was taking place. Words really could not paint the true horror of it. And Jeremiah taught what was happening to his own heart and to his own experience. And in verse 1 of chapter 3 he says, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath 
He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again, all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long death. And yet in the midst of it all, in the midst of the most terrible and the most awful darkness, there is a rainbow, there is a light, and that light is beginning to shine. And he said in verse 21, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. He digs deep into his memory. And he reminds himself of who God is and what God does, even when things look so dark and dismal and everything, nothing is positive at all. But he looks upward and he looks heavenward and he looks to the great God of heaven and the great God of earth. He changes the scene from earth to heaven. And he turns from the terrible calamities of Jerusalem and he looks to the characters and purposes of the Most High. <coughs> and in the midst of it all, these wonderful things absorb his attention. The blackest of clouds are there in Jerusalem. But there is a magnificent rainbow. The darkest days but above there is wonderful and amazing brightness. Man may be cruel, man may be miserable, but God is still on the throne. And God is still there working his purposes out. And then he says this in verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Not only God's love, but it's a great love. It's not a love that is superficial and sentimental, but that love is there even in the darkest hour. Love to the lovely show that they might lovely be. And for New Testament believers, it tells us that God has the very best for us. And not only does God have the very best for us, but because we are in Christ, we are the delight of God. And that love is eternal. That love is unchangeable. And that love is remarkably and gloriously and amazingly great. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Now many years ago in the, 1700, in the 1600s, there was a great theologian called John Owen. And he wrote 16 volumes. And you can read the whole of his works free on the internet if you have a good, clear mind. It's not an easy read. You can look at volume 16 on the doctrine of Scripture and you really do need a good mind to get round John Owen. But he had tragedy in his life. His wife had 11 children and he saw all of those 11 children to the grave. He saw his wife to the grave as well. And in 1662, with many other evangelicals, he was ejected from the Church of England. It was called the Great Ejection. And he was turned out of his church and turned out of his employment. He knew what it was to go through great trial and great tribulation. And it all drove him to prayer. And ultimately to find delight and joy in God. And he wrote this. If we are satisfied with vague ideas about him, we shall find no transforming power communicated to us. 
But when we cling wholeheartedly to him, and our minds are filled with thoughts of him and delight in him, then spiritual power will flow from him to perfect our hearts, increase our holiness, strengthen our graces, and sometimes fill us with joy unspeakable. Now that man you saw, that man you heartache, that man you problems, but in the midst of it all, he could look up. And how thankful we are, as we read in Isaiah 43, and of course this is a passage of God's people returning from exile, but it's also true of every believer, where God says this in Isaiah 43, Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. You notice he doesn't say if, but when. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. And even in the darkest hour and the darkest moment, God will be with his people. He will not leave his people. He will not forsake his people. And if you and I meet God's people who have gone through so much, there are times where we do not feel worthy to be in their presence. When push comes to shove, this is the bottom line. That we have the glorious presence of God comes to his people. In North Korea, there are so many believers still there. And the reason was that in 1907, there was a mighty revival in Pyongyang. And these are descendants, many of them, from the revival. Persecuted and hated but not forsaken of God. And what does our verse say in Lamentations? It says this, Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed. The Lord's people are kept. God's people are saved from hell. And they are dealt with by God's great kindness. And his compassions, they fail not. What are those compassions? It is sympathy and kindness toward those who are in trouble. Isn't it wonderful that the great God of heaven, the all-sufficient God, shows sympathy and kindness toward those who are in trouble, shows great pity because of great fondness for them, because of his amazing love. And God can never be more compassionate today than he is now. When you and I are called upon to go through great times of trouble, we must turn our attention away from our problems to the great God of heaven, and the great God of earth. And remember that we have a compassionate God in heaven, not a cold, unfeeling God. And the greatest compassion he has shown to the believer is to send his Son, and for believers to know that their sins are forgiven. If you listen to the radio broadcast this morning from the Keswick Convention, those who have their sins forgiven are those who are to be envied, we were told. And the good news has come to us and been extended to us. And we thank, you, thank God for the glorious person of the Lord Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us.
Have you known this wonderful compassion? Have you known this so great salvation? Have you known what it is to have your sins forgiven? And know that you are washed clean in the precious blood of the Lamb. And then, of course, these compassions are new every morning. And great is your faithfulness. We have sung that song, He Will Hold Me Fast. And what is that song really doing? It is telling us about the faithfulness of God. Even though these people had broken the covenant, Jeremiah sees that God's faithfulness is ever there. And what is God's faithfulness? It is the assurance that God will fulfill his promises and that God will keep his engagements. God is faithful. Some of you may have a dog in the home. And we often talk about a dog being a man's best friend. But also a dog being a faithful friend. Whereas a cat will go where it's fed. We've had cats and cats go off where they're fed. And he's ever there for his people. And you may have come here this morning and you may say to yourself, I've had a rubbish week. I've fallen and I've faltered. I've not been what I ought to be. I've been a moaner and a complainer. Let me tell you this morning that the faithfulness of God is not dependent on you and me. That is dependent on his grace. And he will perform his promises. And we know that one of the great promises in the word of God is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And it continues to cleanse from all sin like a... Sometimes we have to use a, a wipe of blade, don't we, on our cars? We haven't used them recently, we haven't seen any rain. There was one or two drops in my garden this morning, I thought, ah... Oh, Nothing happened. <laughs> but you know, when you had to use a wiper blade, you wiped, didn't you? And it wiped clean. And then it continues to do so. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, continues to cleanse from all sin. And you need to remember that, my friends, when you and I fall and when you and I fall to. We need to look up afresh to the glorious person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet there's an amazing thing about God's faithfulness. For in Psalm 119 and verse 75, the psalmist says this in the second part of the verse. And in faithfulness you have afflicted me. God's faithfulness is sometimes shown in the way in which he permits afflictions to come upon his people. And the afflictions that we endure in life are the outworking of God's faithfulness. Because in the midst of it all, God shows his promises to be true. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Psalm 33 of verse 4. And he will always do what is best for us, his believing people, in order that we might be drawn closer to him, in order that we might know what it is to cast ourselves upon him and to rest in his promises. Our sister Tet has gone through a number of trials recently, but in the midst of them all, she has often used that phrase, it is well with my soul. And what she is really saying is that God is faithful. I found God to be a faithful friend to me. And what a wonderful thing it is to know that even in the midst of trials, 
When we don't always know what God is doing, we know that things have come to us because of his permission. And in faithfulness, you have afflicted me. And then I want you to notice too, the Lord is my portion. A portion is a quota and an occasion of something. The Levites weren't to have a portion of the land because God was to be their portion. And what we see here in the book of Lamentations is a continual increasing and encouragement to faith in the darkest hour. He is increasing in faith and confidence in God. He concludes here with a firm interest in God because God is his portion. God is his inheritance. And God is our portion in life and in death. He is our portion in time and eternity. His portion is large and full. And he is the one who satisfies his people even in the darkest hour. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. He is a faithful God, and he is a God who is the portion of his people. And there are the times when God's people do not always feel and know his presence. And it is times like that when you and I must rest upon the pure word of God. And God says, not only am I your portion, I am your inheritance. And the wonderful thing is this, and it's almost beyond our comprehension that we are his inheritance too. His love is ours. His power is ours. His grace is ours to support us. His wisdom is shown to us in his word. His love is there to comfort us. His mercy is there when you and I fail and when you and I falter. His covenant will be there to encourage us. That covenant that can never be broken. And one day as heaven will receive us and we will know something of what it is to glory in God as our portion. Now you'll be sitting around a meal later on, I hope. And you'll be given your meal and that will be your portion. You'll eat it and enjoy it. And we have to live upon him. For we know that there is available grace for every child. We have to rejoice in him. And we are to look to him for all we need, not for luxuries. Give us this day our daily bread. We're not to ask for luxuries. And we see him as new covenant believers in Christ. And because we see him in Christ, we are to be utterly devoted to him. For none can take it away. Nothing can separate us from it. What an amazing thing. What amazing, wonderful things we have. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Yes, you and I may be called upon to go through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, you'll see fear is all about me. 
Her fears are always there and they need to be dealt with. Her fears are stilled when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, heaven and other price I stand. And trials come that we might know the reality of some of these wonderful things that we sing so easily and sometimes so glibly. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. And we are to daily enjoy God as our portion. And when we do not feel his presence, we are to seek him and we are to long that we might know it more and more. But one day, one amazing, glorious day, we shall fully enjoy that portion in heaven's glory. We'll be among the blood-bought children of God. It won't just be Grace Baptist there. It'll be all the children of God because God in his inscrutable wisdom has not been pleased to deposit all of his truth with one group of his people. But most groups think he has. There will be no drought there. There will be no trials there. There will be no tribulations there. There will be words to dear believers, well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What is the result? I will wait for him. I will wait for him. It's not easy to wait, is it? Especially if you're waiting for a bus. It's not easy to wait. And two come all together, don't they? Wait for the Lord. He comes in his right time, in the exact time, in the precise time, in the appointed time, and we are to patiently wait for him. And he gives himself to us. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And in spite of all the trials of life, the Christian life is the most <coughs> wonderful and the most glorious and the most amazing. That he should show his great love to those who are the most unworthy of it. To know you and I as we really are, all our thought patterns, all our speech patterns, everything else, to know everything about us. We read that the Lord Jesus, when he was here, he knew the thoughts. The kept to know that he loves us, isn't that amazing? He has the very best for us and he has an affection for us and he has a delight in us because he sees the believer in Christ. But do you have God as your portion? If you don't, my friend, you really need to have him as your portion. You see, you need the grace of the Lord Jesus. And grace is undeserved kindness. Now, on Tuesday, we're going up to visit some old friends who used to worship here many years ago called Ray and Helen. And on Wednesday, we're going on to spend a week with our son and daughter-in-law and little grandson, he'll be two on Tuesday. And last time we were there, we went to their Anglican church where there was a baptizing service. It was baptism by immersion. They hadn't opened the font, we were told, for 20 years. And it was wonderful to see it. And the man who gave the word that day was the Bishop of Warwick, and he gave a tremendous word. And he goes into prisons 
And he said he found people easier to reach in prison than in church, because in prison, late people know they've messed up. And one of the men helping in the baptism that day was a man who was aglow with God. And when we got home, John told me, he said, you know what that man was before he became a Christian? He was a drug dealer. And his wife is an ex-drug addict. So think of the many lives that he destroyed. And yet he knew the grace of the Lord Jesus. And the welcome in that fellowship. Grace is amazing. Would you have shown grace like that did? Jesus did. And if Jesus shows grace to a person like that, he can show grace to you this morning. As he showed grace to me. And grace to many believers in this place. Instead of drugs, he lives for Christ. And therefore you must come and stand <coughs> as you are in all your need. Because let's face it, we've all messed up. We're all guilty. We're all on the same level. That's what, that's what the Bible shows us. All of sin. We're all in the same boat. Same boat as a drug stealer. We all need the same wonderful Saviour who bled and died on Calvary, who took the terrible punishment due to sin and bore it all away. Do you know that? Do you know that as a present reality? You need to know that. Don't rest on anything you've ever done. Rest on all that Christ has done and come to him in all your need. You know what they were doing executing believers in North Korea? They were enabling those believers to fully enjoy their inheritance in heaven and fully enjoy God as their portion. If your life was taken today, where would you be? Oh, that you would come and you see God in Christ and trust in him. Let us finish with John Newton this morning. Listen to John Newton. Surely mercy and goodness have followed me all my days. He has been my God and my guide. He found me in a waste howling wilderness in the most hopeless state of sin and misery. But in consequence of his everlasting purpose and love, he was pleased to deliver me from ruin, to call me by his grace, to give me a name and place amongst his children and amongst his ministers. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained. Me. Can you say that with John Newton? He was pleased to deliver me from ruin, to call me by his grace, to give me a name and place amongst his children. All oh, this morning, in this place, hearing this word, that you might truly know that in your heart and be saved. Let us pray. Almighty and ever blessed God, we thank you that you are our portion, a portion of your God's people. And what a portion that is. Oh, that you might be more and more our all in all, that Christ might be our all in all. For me to live is Christ, said Paul the Apostle, and to die is gain. The most glorious person to live for is Christ. Enable us to do that day by day in all the troubles of life. 
And we pray for those, O oh God, who don't know this in our midst. And we pray that by your grace they will. And you'll open their eyes and help them to trust the crucified Christ and to trust in him alone for salvation. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.